are so many legends in this building today. Legendary. Well, today we are with a dear friend of mine, someone that I have admired for a very long time. Uh, we knew about him before we ever met him, and he was instrumental with my kids, but also some legendary songs, legendary artists. He is one of the most prolific men I know in regard to his knowledge of music and music history and the details behind songs, but I have been fortunate enough to call him friend. Today, we're welcoming Steve Greenberg from S-Curve Records and many other accolades, and uh, along with the other legends that we've been interviewing today, one of my favorite people in the entire music industry. Steve, thank you for being with us. Well, we met, obviously, related to my kids, but I wanted to kind of go as far back as we could to how it all began for you. Because I'm aware of some key moments with a, another set of brothers, and but you were doing this before then. So how did you get started in this business? What started this career that inspired so many people? What's a little bit crazy is that I, I actually never intended to be in the music business. Uh, I never envisioned myself working at a record company or doing anything professionally uh, in the music business. When I was in college, I was a DJ on my college radio station, and I always was somebody who loved music and knew a lot about music and studied record charts. I used to buy all those books that would compile the history of record charts and you know look and see all the number one records of a certain year and all that stuff. And, and I listened to a lot of music. Uh, but I always thought I would be an academic, actually. And after college, I uh, took some time off. I was a DJ on a pirate radio station called The Voice of Peace that broadcast off the coast of uh, Israel in the Mediterranean. And it broadcast to Israel and all of its neighboring countries like uh, Lebanon and Jordan and Egypt in the name of peace. That is pop. amazing. It was a pop radio station. It was very famous in that region at the time because uh for a lot of those countries it was the only real like contemporary pop music radio station this is the early 80s and uh instead of having commercials for say mcdonald's or pepsi or something they had commercials for peace <laughs> i love that and i lived on the ship for several months and dj'd on the ship and it was a real crucible because literally all you did all day was prepare your radio show broadcast your radio show you broadcast for about eight hours a day each dj um, broadcast your radio show and then sleep essentially. <laughs> so then I, then I came back to America and I studied uh, communication research at Stanford to get an MA. And my vision was to become a professor. Uh, and, uh, but even in my academic studies, I kept getting pulled back into pop music. I did my master's thesis on how a series of uh, new technological innovations over the decades change the shape continuously of the pop music audience, like how the introduction of TV in the 50s changed the shape of the pop music audience, and the transistor radio in the 60s, and FM radio in the 70s, and MTV in the 80s, and how every one of those technological breakthroughs caused the whole pop audience to sort of be shattered and re reconfigured. So I was wow. always really interested in, in the pop music, in pop music, the pop music audience. Um, and I and it seems you were also very interested and I know you still have an interest in how technology and the development of technology can benefit music today. It definitely can benefit it today, but it definitely changes it. Every time a new technology comes in, it changes the way we use music, the way we relate to music. Let's look at TikTok today, right? What's mm -hmm. happened with TikTok is essentially TikTok has created a new function for pop music. And that function is to serve as a soundtrack for an audience member to express themselves. That's yeah. a that's a use for pop music that we didn't contemplate before. You know, um, it used to be that the music would come from the artist to the to the audience, but now essentially the audience is sending it back out into the world, but putting their own spin on it by having themselves visually do something to the music, and so they're oh. creating their own little piece of art based on somebody else's piece of art. Um, so that, Amazing. That's, changed, that's changed things, you know, incredibly. Um, so anyway, I, I, I thought I would be a professor, but I took a year off um, to basically to, to, to make some money because like, you know, you, you, you have students, you're, you get into debt, you don't have any money, you, you're broke. So I thought, okay, I'm going to uh, take a year off and, and make some money and then I'll go back and finish my PhD. So I got a job working for Warner Music's international division 
writing press releases and artist bios. That was my first job. Um, the, the reason I wound up getting a job with a record company was because I, I, I had just done my uh, master's thesis that I explained to you about technology and music. And during the course of that research, I wound up interviewing a man named Irv Lichtman, who was the editor of Billboard at the time in the 80s. And so I called Irv Lichtman. I, did, I didn't know many people like, in the professional world. I was a student, you know. So I called Irv Lichtman and I said, hey, I, I'm, gonna, I'm looking for a job for, for a while to make some money. Do you know of anything? And he said, yeah, there's this job at Warner Music. So I, I got that job. Um, and it was really almost random, you know, that I did that. I mean, obviously, I knew a lot about music, and that's what, and, and that's why I wrote the thesis. But if I hadn't written the thesis about that, I wouldn't have known the guy from Billboard. You know? <laughs> and that, but you still, it was your initiative. You basically pursued it yourself. Yes, and I'll tell you what's funny is that he actually gave me a couple of leads, and I thought that the place that I would be most useful would be in one of those syndicated uh, shows where they would do like rock history stuff that they used to have on FM stations, on you know, rock stations, you know, these like rock history kind of kind of shows. And there was a company that was very uh, prominent in that field. And he got me an interview with the guy who owned that company. And I went in and I met the guy and we had a great conversation and it was, you know, it was amazing. And we're sharing stories about records and he understands that I really know a lot about music mm -hmm. and all that. And then he brings up the fact that he had worked at Arista Records in the 70s. And so he's trying to quiz me now. And he says, well, what was the first hit ever on Arista Records? And I say, Mandy by Barry Manilow. <laughs> and he goes, okay, well, what was the second? I go, Midnight Blue by Melissa Manchester. And he goes, yeah, but when did it peak? And I go, oh, when did it peak? I said, I said kind of like, I remember, kind of like, you know, Last week of July, first week of August, 1975. Um, and he goes, no, it was Memorial Day weekend, 1975. <laughs> I remember it very clearly. You know, we were toasting her. I, mean, I was in, you know, on vacation somewhere and we were toasting her. And I said, not, and I was trying to now be really like, I don't want to be aggressive with the guy because I want to get a job, right? But I also don't want to back down if I think I'm right. So I'm like, I'm like I don't know. I, I just, I just kind of think it was like the end of July, beginning of August, you know? Um, <laughs> and I don't want to make too big of a deal out of it, but he's now making a big deal out of it. He goes, no, it was Memorial Day. And, and then he says to me, I want you to go to the library, because back then there was no internet, right? So that's he, right. I want you to go to the library, find Billboard, and you come back and tell me when it, uh, when it uh, peaked. So I go to the library. And sure enough, the record spent a couple of weeks in the top 10, the last week of July and the first week of August, 1975. And um, I come back, I call him up and I say, so I went to the library as you asked and I looked it up and it was number, it was in the top 10, um, you know, the end of July, beginning of August, uh, 1975. He goes, okay, thanks a lot. And then he hung up and I never heard from him again. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, knowing you, that is so true to your character. Yeah, I didn't want to be a jerk about it. You know, like I, I, <laughs> I, I wasn't like putting, he asked me the question for starters. I wasn't trying to show off. You know? No, no, no. But you speak your mind. Yeah. I, yeah. And I just, you definitely have a strength in your resolve that uh, has been a big part of your successes. And and we have benefited from that as well because you fought so hard for my family and my kids. It's worth fighting for, for sure. But anyway, so, so yeah, so I finally, I get this job at WIA International and I'm writing press releases. And I really thought I was going to go back in a year to go get, finish my PhD. And somewhere during that first year, um, Warner International hired this new man to be the head of international A&R and, and marketing based out of London. Guy had, he was Dutch and had a great name. His name was Kick Van Hengel. And that is a um, great name. And I met Kick Van Hengel in the office and we just hit it off really well. And he loved music and he appreciated my love of music. And he said to me, don't go back to school. Don't go back to school. Stay here. I'm going to make a job for you. I want you to travel the world and be my eyes and ears. Like this is a time of great expansion in the music business. The CD had brought in, you know, incredible riches into the music business. And there was a lot of money to spend and to develop new businesses and to do all kinds of exciting things. And he said, you know, we're, we're expanding in so many ways where 
we're opening companies in countries where we never were before. We're opening classical divisions. We're opening video divisions. And, and, and I can't be everywhere. I want to just send you all around the world to just find things out and look, 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 be my eye, eyes and ears. And um, you don't even, he goes, he goes, you don't even have to have an apartment in New York. You can put your stuff in storage and just travel. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if wow. someone had told me that as a young man, I, they couldn't stop me. I'd be at the airport waiting. Of course, right. I'm in my 20s, right? So I'm like, okay, right? So I wind up staying. I'm thinking I'll stay another extra year, you know, but I wound up staying now 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I did that and I traveled the world. And, and then one of the great gigs that I had as part of that, that I sort of wiggled as part of this new job for We International was to have access to their back catalog and make compilations for the international market. And oh, I just did that. Awesome. I would make great compilations and put in like history of funk, history of disco. I did like history of California rock. They were all very historical kind of things. Although sometimes I just did, did stuff for fun. Like I once did one called um, Sonny and Cher, their greatest hits alone and together. <laughs> Which wow. Was really funny. Um, <laughs> so, cause you know, Sonny actually had solo records in the, in the sixties. And of course Cher had all those solo records. So um, I did all those. And then I, got this idea, and this was a real turning point for my career. I got this idea to um, try to develop a box set of every song that ever came out on the Stax record label. Now, I, I had really fallen in love with the Stax record label in that period, in the late 80s, um, because there, were, there was this sort of club that met once a, once a month in New York, a dance club where you would dance to obscure old soul records called the Empire State Soul Club. And they would play these records, and I, I never heard of most of the records because the, the whole point of those kind of things is to be really obscure. So I'd go up to the DJ and say, "What is that?" And like more often than not, the record was on stacks that this guy would be playing. And mm -hmm. I, I knew the big stacks hits, like everybody knows "Doc of the Bay" and "Soul Man," right? Green Onions, you know those kind of things. But right. there was all this obscure stuff. And there was this record called "Big Bird" by Eddie Floyd that everyone would go crazy about when he would play it, but it was never a hit or anything. And I started to think to myself, boy, if, you know, if that record is so good and some of these others are so good, I want to hear them all, you know, like I, I, I want to know every one of these. So I came up with this idea, really mostly so I could hear all the records. Of like, <laughs> what if we compiled every single that came out on Stax Records? And so um, I proposed this, this, this idea and I, you know, it was basically going to be a nine CD box set because there were two, over 240 songs that would be on this box set. And back then the largest collection of, CDs that had ever come out in pop was um, four CDs. Like they had like an Eric Clapton retrospective that was four CDs. Wow. I said, we're gonna do nine CDs. You know, we're gonna have like a hundred <laughs> booklet. You know, it's gonna, and I bring this idea to Kick Van Hengel and Kick Van Hengel said, well, you know, that's a very ambitious idea. Um, I, you can only do this idea if you can find two major territories that say that they want to put it out. Because it's too much to just do and right. voice it upon people. Uh, remember, none of this is for America. It's all for outside of America. I was with We Are International. So um, I was on a business trip to Japan, and I explained the idea to somebody at the Japanese company. He's like, oh, that's really incredible. You know, and I say, well, you know, would you put it out? And he said, well, you know, we put it out, but please, you know, don't do it on our account. You know what I mean? But if it's right. coming out anyway, then sure, we'll put it out. Sounds very exciting. And then I went to England on a business trip and I had exactly the same conversation. And they also said like, you know, that sounds amazing, but like, don't do it on our account. But if it exists, of course, we'd love to put it out. So I, of course I was able to go back to kick Van Hengel and say, okay, Japan and England are in. <laughs> right. <laughs> so together. So, yeah. So he let me do it. And then it, it wasn't going to even come out in America. Um, yeah. Cause we were the international arm and um, I didn't, it, it was a very, like it was a very kind of exciting project. Like rock journalists were excited by the prospect of this existing because they wanted to hear all the records too. Remember, this is before the internet. You couldn't just go on YouTube and like look for a song and find it. If you wanted to find a song that was obscure, that wasn't a hit, you had to do a lot of searching. You had to go to record from record store to record store, search through the bins. If you found it, it might cost a hundred dollars, you know, for a rare single. Um, That's right. So um, people were excited that this would exist. And so I did this interview with Rolling Stone and they said, well, you know, we can only really run this piece about this uh, upcoming project if it's going to come out in America or, you know, our magazine comes out in America. That's our audience. And they said, so is it going to come out in America? I said, like, oh, yeah, it's going to come out in America. Of course. It's <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, um, so 
that comes out in Rolling Stone that it's going to come out in America and Atlantic Records, which has the which was part of Warner, which has the rights to stacks in America, sort of the pressure was on. Like everyone's like, oh my God, this is coming out. This is so exciting. So they put it out. <laughs> that is so and, good. And that kind of is what really launched my career because I, I got nominated for a Grammy for it and came to the attention of a lot of people and wound up moving from the international division into A&R in the U.S. Um, and that's where I started, you know, making records with, with young new artists. Wow. That's quite a story because yet again, that, that's you figuring it out. Yeah. Some, somebody once said to me, they said, you made stone soup. <laughs> you know that book, stone soup for kids. Yeah. That's amazing. You well, you know, Mike Mangini once said when we had finished some music for my kids, he said, oh, if you think he's good on this side of the record, wait till he kicks in the marketing side. He's an even greater genius. And we, and we uh, did some fun things on the marketing side on that first Jonas Brothers record. That was that was fun. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's so amazing. Let, the way we get, so let, 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 let's, let's move the story. For, so, so then I, you know, I, I had a couple of A&R jobs and um, wound up as head of A&R of Mercury Records, which was part of a company called Polygram, which was used to be one of the big major label groups. And um, somebody sent me this tape uh, of this young kid singing this song. And the song was so great, you know, like everything about the demo was so great. I was kind of sure that I was being put on a little bit, like this kid couldn't really be singing as well. This must be augmented or something. And, you know, they're not right. really playing their own instruments. This is, you know, this is a fake, you know. But I, the song was really great. So um, I decided to go out and see them at a, a county fair in Kansas. And the group was, was Hanson. Um, and they, I got, went to see them and they really were that great. Like they got on stage and they performed the song and he sang as well as he sang it on the demo and they all played their instruments. And so um, I, I said to them, I wanna make a record with you. And they didn't believe me. They thought when I left, when I, when I left the county fair after spending some time with them, they thought they'd never hear from me again. But <laughs> I actually, I called them back and we made the Hanson record. And uh, as it happened, it was a big record. It was a number one single called Umbop. And it launched them. And it also kind of played a role in helping to bring back pop music. You no know, question. We were in a period of like of grunge rock and that was really interesting music, but it wasn't like that bright pop music that a lot of people, you know, just enjoy and brings a smile to your face. And in fact, I, I kind of like had been hoping to find something like Hanson for a while. Um, I remember going into the supermarket in the mid nineties and I was on the checkout line and you know, they have those teen magazines that they'll put mm -hmm. on the checkout, you know, while you're waiting to check out this little magazine rack. And I picked up some teen magazine and I looked through it and I saw that like all the teens that were in the magazine, the stars who were in the magazine were all actors. It was this kid named like Jonathan Taylor Thomas or something. Who was right. An actor and there's some other people, but there were no music stars. And I realized, Oh, of course there are no music stars. You know, these grunge guys, right. Eddie Vedder, you know, from Pearl Jam or Kurt Cobain, they're not really like, you know, for like, you know, the, the kind of artists like for, that you'd want to have like young, young kids read about in these teen magazines. It, it's, it's not the aesthetic of a teen magazine. It's a little dark. It's a little mature. And a little more dangerous. Yeah, a little more dangerous. Exactly. So I thought, oh, I wish, I, I feel there's like a hole in the market. Like, I feel like there's got to be a generation of, of, you know, of teenage girls who want to like, you know, hear music by, you know, by kind of positive, uplifting, you know, kind of artists and not just this kind of dark, dark, darker music. Um, and so I, I really, I, so when Hanson's demo came to me, I said, oh, this could be that thing, you know? And so we really helped bring back pop music in the second half of the nineties. I would say Hanson and the Spice Girls together really. Yeah. Right. And, and the truth is the Spice Girls were first. Um, you know, I made this record and everyone was very skeptical about the record, not because they didn't think it was a good record, but because the world was very grungish and they said, right. how are you to break through with this thing, you know, in a world of grunge? And then I remember at the beginning of 1997, I heard on the radio um, Wannabe by the Spice Girls. Mm -hmm. and that had already been the number one song of the year in England the year before. But it made it over to America and I heard it on the radio in New York. And I, and I immediately, as soon as I heard Wannabe on the radio, I said, oh my God, if they're playing this, there's no way they can't play Umbop. And I just knew at that point we'd have a really big hit because the Spice Girls essentially had knocked the door down. That's awesome. You know that my kids, 
you know, of course, Hanson was an inspiration. Uh, and they actually, I vividly remember, because Joe and Kevin were a little older, Nick loved it. He loved the voice. Uh, but the older brothers said, Dad, you have to listen to this. It's not just a song. It's a great record. It is a great record. Everything about that record is great. There's great producers on that record. First, we had the Dust Brothers, who had just produced um, the, Big Beck, the Big Beck record at that time. Right. And then we had a guy named Stephen Laroni, had, who had produced really amazing um, uh, British records by a, a group called Black Grape um, that I loved. They never made it over here, but they were big in England. And so we had a lot of amazing people working on that record. And, you know, the Dust Brothers added that little scratch that's on the chorus. That's a big part of the hook. And, uh, you know, I will say, though, that, you know, like a lot of young artists and new artists, like Hanson had a lot of trouble getting their head around the evolution of that record from their little demo that they'd done to the finished record. And sometimes when you take a record, you take a song that, you know, comes out of the heart and soul of a, of a, of an artist who wrote the song and then recorded it. And you start to bring other people in and they start to transform it a little bit. It can be very disconcerting for the, for the artist. No question about it. And you have to, and when you're working on artists, you have to balance trying to be respectful to what they're, original vision is, but also trying to help them evolve that vision to make it something that the whole world can appreciate. And when you've done it long enough, you also understand that part of, of people being stuck on their original vision is, is what we in the industry call demo-itis, which is where if you've heard a song a certain way enough times, you believe that's the only way the song can be. And that right. anything that's different than that is a mistake and makes it worse. And so you have to kind of really help an artist tease out what's really essential to their vision and what's really just demo-itis. Right. And what will help them reach the masses because even though they think they know, and I'm going to put it in quotes, their brand, there's about 10 people showing up. Yeah, that's right. The, 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 ar artists, you know, always, always, um, I think, pay the most attention to the loudest fans, you know, and yeah. I think especially, by the way, in, in today's world with social media, um, I think what happens is a lot of artists um, can mistake those people who are most present on social media talking about them or talking to them for their entire fan base. And the entire fan base just might not be the same as the most absolutely rabid fans. And you have to, again, try to like drown out that noise a little bit and see the bigger picture because it's so easy to like only hear who's right in your face. You know, same thing like if you're an artist and you do concerts, you know, you have those people in the front who are the most crazy fans, you know, and the most rabid fans. Right. Um, but you have to remember that that's, that's a small percentage of the people who are in the room. And there are people who are up in the balcony who are also your fans. And, you know, uh, they might all, you know, they, they, they're all your fans. And, and don't just listen to the people in the front row. Right. And don't just listen to the ones you have. You know, be strategic about going beyond your boundaries. That's right. I think artists artists should should kind of always try to strike a balance between serving their fans and getting new fans. Yeah. Um, and that and, and totally it becomes hard. It becomes hard because, like I said, I think it starts to become somewhat seductive to just serve your fans um, because, again, they're the ones who are already in contact with you. Um, right. But if you remember, there's ones that you that may never be in contact with you, but who are who just are going to be important fans, and they might live in far flung places, and they might live somewhere where you're never going to be on tour. You know, they'll never see you live, but, uh, but they're going to be big fans. Mm, uh, that's so, true. So we, we, did, we, did, we did that great Hanson record. and well, It a, was an explosion. It I was mean, a, it's, get, get, now that time has elapsed, people forget, but it was a massive explosion. I mean, those kids and that song rocked the world. Yeah, yeah. They, they were great, and they were great live. I mean, they, you know, they, were, they went from not playing any shows at all, you know, to playing arenas. Yeah. You know, they never, Hanson never opened for anyone ever. Crazy. And straight from like not being able to do shows <laughs> to headlining. Um, and by the way, at the end of the first year, we actually, like by the end of the first year, we already made a Hanson live album, which was recorded at, a, at an arena in Seattle. Like it was totally nuts. Uh, and, and it was great. Now, but then Hanson and, and I, and with, you know, 20 years of hindsight, I respect this they um, decided that they didn't want that life. They were hmm. big pop stars. Their fans were, you know, 15-year-old girls, maybe 13-year-old, even 12-year-old girls. 
and they felt that they wanted to be what they felt were serious musicians. I, I felt they already were serious musicians. They were making great records that lots of people loved, but they wanted to not be in that pop game. They wanted to be like a real, like a rock band. And so they took a couple years off at the height of that, after that first album, they took a couple years off and just toured and wanted to become a really great live band. That was their goal. They wanted to be like really, really good, have like music fans really like them. And now, you know, with the benefit of, of 20 years uh, hindsight, we look at it and say, okay, they never had a big pop hit again, but they did manage to carve out a career where it's 23 years after Umbop and they still can come to town and play a pretty large venue and fill it with people who, uh, who respect them as musicians and just like everything they've done in the last 20 years. And that's a good career. You it's know, a it's great a, career. It's a different career than they could have had if they wanted to just go for it um, on the pop side, but they didn't want that. They wanted a different thing and they got it and they all have great lives. They all still live out in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they were brought up and they all have lots of kids. I think between the three of them, they might have eight or nine kids. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's what they're doing. Amazing. Well, I'm glad they knew who they were. I, you could hear it in the music. Even in the first record, there there was a depth of writing, musicianship. Of course, I was asking the questions like, who produced this? <laughs> you know, who was, wrote with them? Yeah, Steve, uh, Stephen Laroni produced most of the record, and then uh, Umbop was produced by Stephen and the Dust Brothers. And um, and the writers, they wrote Umbop themselves. We have to give them 100% credit on that incredible song. Um, but then the rest of the album, they had some of the best co-writers in the world that we brought in. We brought in Desmond Child, who had written all the Bon Jovi hits, and Barry Mann and Cynthia Weil, who were legendary, you know, Absolutely. 70s songwriters, and Mark Hudson. Mark um, Hudson. Yeah, that's a name I, that I remember. And he did a lot of work with them. So we, we, like, we brought in like the best co-writers. We That was a very... Um, a wonderful project to work on because you, know, you had these incredibly talented people who you could put in a room with other talented people and they'd come up with magic. And it was really fun just coming up with the questions and seeing what would happen. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was really one of the most fun projects I, I ever worked on in my life. Um, That's but great. Then, what's crazy is then about a year later, <coughs> excuse me, about a year later, um, Mercury, which was part of Polygram, Polygram got sold to Universal. Um, this is like the beginning of Universal really becoming mm -hmm. the company that it is today. Their first big move is they bought Polygram. And that meant they bought um, Mercury Records and Island Records and A&M Records and you know, a lot of big labels. And so uh, they closed down the Mercury label and absorbed it into Island. And I was the head of a of Mercury. So that basically meant that my label didn't exist anymore. So I was able to take that opportunity and take a year off i just basically like they they had to pay me and i i had like a year left on my contract and um i there was no label anymore mm. so so i got like that, that rare treat of getting to be go home and be paid for not working which was great because my wife had just had our first child so it was great to sort of be home during that period yeah that's great i've never had that luxury but a few of my friends uh, ended up with a year or two off uh, as the labels were consolidating. Yeah, it happened. So, you know, I was, I was, I, I, I used that year, I was writing a lot, just, you know, fiction, just stuff, you know, just trying to be, be a creative guy. And um, I had this one idea in my head for a record that I thought if I could get it right, I could have a really big hit. And eventually I could all kind of clicked in my head of how to get, how to do this record. I'd heard a song and I, but I knew that it was all done all wrong. But if I could do it right, it could be a big hit. And so I finally said, oh, I know how to do that record. So I decided to come back into the music business and, um, and you know, make this record that I thought I, I, thought I, could, um, I could have success with. And the record was Who Let the Dogs Out. <laughs> You've told me oh, that yes, story, but you have to share how you uh, brought, brought that song here. And, of course, Mike Mangini and his reaction. Oh yeah, yeah. So the, the the thing was that the version of the song that I had heard um, originally was a very, very, very bad version. It's horrible, like a horrible, horrible record. It was a guy with a fake Caribbean accent, and he made this video where he was in a dog suit. It was really bad. So, <laughs> um, so 
um, I brought it to Mike Mangini, who I wanted to produce it, and he just thought I was crazy. This is like the worst record ever, you know. I said, no, no, if we do it this other way, you know, I think it could be really good. And he just gave me the benefit of the doubt, thankfully, and then made an incredible record. And of course, we had lots, lots of su amazing success with it, really. And you know, to this day, it is a, uh, it's a, it's a well-known song, even for kids who weren't alive when it when it came out. And almost more importantly for me, it launched my record label, S Curve Records. Wow. Uh, and you know, it, we put that. We we started the label really for the sole purpose of putting out that song, and the song was so successful, it left us with this kind of record label that had just made a lot of money and could invest a bunch of money into some other projects. So we we did. We we signed Fountains of Wayne, who uh, we put out Stacy's Mom by Fountains of Wayne, and then we discovered another very young artist, a, a, a girl in England who was 14 at the time, named Joss Stone, who had this incredible R&B voice. And we brought her over to America and we made uh, a couple of albums with her. And between the two albums, we sold 8 million albums um, with Joss Stone. And Joss Stone had a very different career trajectory because um, she sold 8 million albums back in, this is again, back in the days before uh, the music industry went digital, really. But she sold 8 million CDs, CD albums. Yeah. Without ever really having a big hit single. She was an album artist, um, which was a thing you used to be able to be. But you put together, Back again, a killer team for her. Yeah, it was me and Mike Mangini and a amazing, one of the most amazing people I've ever met um, on so many levels, Betty Wright. Now, Betty Wright was a legendary soul singer from Miami. And she actually had had her first hit when she was um, 13 years old. She had a top 10 R&B hit called Girls Can't Do What the Guys Do. And mm -hmm. then she had her biggest hit in the early 70s when she was 17, called Clean Up Woman. And she'd gone on just to have an incredible career. Um, and I thought that Betty could be a real mentor to Joss Stone because Betty had been a, a precocious singer at such a young age and having success and having such an incredible voice as a kid that she could really help bring out the best in Joss Stone and help her learn how to, how to, how to sing and, you know, on a record and all. And so we brought in Betty Wright and Betty Wright proved to be the secret ingredient that helped that Joss, those Joss Stone records become magical. And, you know, we, we were nominated for multiple Grammy awards. And as I said, you know, sold crazy amounts of records um, and made records that I'm just really, really proud of. The first record was literally a collection of obscure soul songs. Once again, that I thought would be great that they were so obscure that if we put them out, um, people would think they were new songs even. They wouldn't even know that they had existed before because they were so obscure. We had this one called, song called Super Duper Love. Um, yeah. That was a big hit for her. And you know, no one knew that record. You know, I used to play that record when I would DJ at these obscure soul record clubs. And every time I played that original version of that record by a guy named Sugar Billy, um, the floor would just fill up. People loved it. They thought it was a great song. So I said, I'm going to do this with Joss Stone because everyone loves this record and I bet you will have a hit with Joss Stone. And, and we did. That was one of her most famous songs. And one of the most fulfilling things about, about doing that song, um, which I didn't expect, was after the song popular and after the album had sold all those millions of copies, I got a phone call from Sugar Billy. Wow. And he said... He said, you know, I've, I've never made any money on this song until now. <laughs> and now I'm making a lot of money on this. You know, he's, he was, he, the album that it was on sold almost 4 million copies. Um, and he said, he goes, you know, this is so big, like for me and my kids, like it's really amazing um, that I'm that's, finally That's money. amazing. And, and I, he lived in St. Louis. And I said, well, you know, we're, Joss is coming to town to do a show. Um, it would be great if you wanted to come up on stage and do super duper love with her. And he said, well, I actually can't, I'm actually not well. And it turned out that he was dying of cancer at the time. And uh, he died shortly thereafter. But I always, always feel like, wow, it's so great that he lived long enough to see his song become a well-known song. And he also lived long enough to see his song earn all this money that presumably his, his kids got which I thought was just, it's just one of those things that's, that happens, you know, in the music business, you never know when you do stuff, how it's going to play out and whose life it's going to affect. But, uh, and who's going to be listening to it and DJing it that would find this young superstar and know how to pull those pieces together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I had one other story that that reminds me of a story that's completely unrelated, but it's a, it's such a good story. Um, when I was in my 
era of making those compilation albums in, for international market, as I talked about. Um, there was a song that I really wanted to put on one of the compilations by, again, very obscure, not a record that anybody really ever heard when it first came out, by a duo called Jimmy and Vela Cameron. And they um, were a brother-sister act. And um, it turned out that in order to get their song on the compilation, I actually needed to get permission like directly from them. Mo most artist deals back in the 60s and 70s, you didn't, nobody had all the rights to give you permission. But on this one case, I needed to get permission from the, from the artist and I couldn't find Jimmy Cameron. And eventually I managed through BMI to get his address. No, mm -hmm. sorry, I got his phone number. I'm, no, I got his, let me get it right. I got his address. I got his address and I wrote him a letter and said I wanted to use his song. And a couple months later, I get a phone call back from Jimmy Cameron. And he says, I'm really sorry that I um, took so long to get back to you. Um, I don't have a phone. Mm. And so I had to wait until I was going over to my sister's house to use her phone. And I was very surprised. I said, what do you mean you don't have a phone? He goes, yeah, well, you know, times have been really tough and I just, I don't have a phone. And I said, but surely you got all that money from the Simply Red record, right? He goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, you know that your song, It's Only Love, was covered by a British group called Simply Red and was a massive hit all over Europe last year. It was never a hit in America, by the way. I, I said it was a massive hit all over Europe. Remember, I spent all that time internationally. Right. So I knew that the song was really big. I said, your song was massive all over Europe last year. I said, you must have made a lot of money writing that song, you know? And he goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. I go, I go, he goes, he goes, I go, you should really look into this. Like call BMI, call somebody because like you had a big hit last year and you don't even know it. <laughs> and, wow. and he, and he did. And he called me back about a month later. And he said, thank you so much for telling me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is great. Like this is, this is the break I've been waiting for. So, you know, <laughs> It's such a weird world. Like you never know. I, I always say like, just, as long as you show up every day and do stuff, you never know what's going to come out of it. If you, the, the worst thing you could do is do nothing. You stay home right. and do nothing. Nothing's going to happen. I promise. You know, but if you go out and just try to do crazy stuff happens that like you didn't even expect to have happen. Yeah. Well, if you just do stuff and you have the, the knowledge and the experience and the antennas that you have. I mean, some people would miss Hanson completely. Josh Stone would be too young and yeah. kind of out there. Uh, it, but you see it. Who let the dogs out for sure? Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you know, Hanson actually was what led me to your sons, the Jonas Brothers, right? Because what happened was I, I got offered this job as president of Columbia Records in the mid 2000s, you know, 2000, it was 2004 that they offered me the job. And, as I was kind of transitioning into the job, they sent me this stack of CDs and they were CDs of artists that they didn't know if they wanted to drop or not. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if I would weigh in about whether they should drop these artists. And I went through this pile and most of it was just not interesting at all to me. And then I get to this record by Nicholas Jonas. That's right. <laughs> and, and I put it on and I'm like, wait a second. This guy sounds like the guy from Hanson. Like this guy has a great voice. Like, like I want to meet this guy. You know, <laughs> this is interesting to me. You know, um, and so that's how I, I ended up meeting meeting the Jonas Brothers. Well, I'll never forget the call because you know I was acutely aware that when that particular record, dear God, uh, when it went out, it fell into that hole. It wasn't Christian enough for Christian, and it was too Christian for mainstream. So. It was just, we don't know what to do with it. We released a Christmas song Nick and I wrote, and it did well. But at that point, the record was basically done, burnt, spent. Uh, and so I get a call. The guy that signed them, uh, also you know, a lifetime friend, David Massey, he calls me, he says, hey, Kevin, there's a new president at Columbia, and he wants to get on the phone with you. And I went, oh, crap. Because what I fully expected was to be dropped on that phone call and to have the boys, Nick at that point, um, you know, to have that exercise over because the, the record, we had already plowed through a few things 
and didn't know exactly what was going to happen from it. And when I received the call and you actually were like, this is the best thing I've heard at Columbia. I knew they weren't going to be dropped, <laughs> but, but I was also so incredibly relieved. You probably couldn't tell that there were tears streaming down my face because the last conversation I wanted to have with Nick was that it was over at what, 11, 12 years old. Wow. That's, I, I didn't even know that until this second, that, that that's what you expected. Uh, I had even kind of braced like, Hey, I have a call with the new president and you know, I, I been at it long enough to know that those first calls typically are drops like a lot of coaches, you know, you go through your team and you refine your roster. So I was shaking when you called because I was just so nervous that it would be the end of Nick Nicholas at the time and his brothers had joined him on a couple songs. And that's what you said. And I understand there are brothers. <laughs> Right. That's, I really wanted to do brothers as, a, as an act. I felt that I, I, I knew how to do that, you know? Oh, for sure. So, so, and I, I also remember I met, I met the, I met all the brothers and I said, do you play instruments? And I said, they said, well, we're learning our instruments. I said, I said, great, you're a band, you know, <laughs> because I know one thing about like young guys who are like musical and the guys were obviously musical. I said, I knew that young guys who are musical can learn their instrument. If, mm -hmm. if they're motivated and there's a reason to, to learn their instruments, they'll, they'll learn their instruments well enough to be to perform live and be a band. So I, I, I remember the, the, the one thing I really do take credit for was moving them from being guys who like might have like danced to track to being to, to being a band. I said, no, you guys should just be a band. Like, because I know that there were, there were people who were like coaching them on like dancing and stuff. I said, no, forget that. Be a band, you know. That's awesome. That's well, you that. know, and the other thing I remember you did, and again, it's it's that gift you have, Steve. You asked them what they listened to and what they preferred and the concerts that they went to. And, of course, Nick, you know, he was influenced by Stevie Wonder. He was influenced by Broadway for sure. He had this, but a, a more soulful voice. It was always a part of his life. But the other brothers were influenced by bands. You know, it the, they loved those alternative rock bands. And yeah, I remember when we, when we made that first record. I think I, I wanted, I think I wanted them to kind of sound like All American Rejects or something. That sort of was the the vision. Like that's like you know that was that's a kind of music that young guys can play and write and yeah, Fallout Boy. That whole season of great alternative pop. Yeah, that yeah. you just stirred the pot and. <laughs> But, yeah, but they were great. Like in the same way that Hanson were great, they were great. Like I remember standing on a street corner um, in uptown, uptown in New York, um, and I don't remember why we were. Oh, we were in front of like a, a parking garage. They were going to the car to to leave. To, to leave, they had just come from like a rehearsal studio or something, and they said, "Can we sing you a song we just wrote?" I said, "Sure," and they sang me "Mandy," which was the song that was on their first album, and I was, and they sang it a cappella. <laughs> I was blown away. I'm like, wow, you wrote that? That's incredible. You know, like that's an amazing song. So I, so I knew that they were just because they had written this. You know, when when you can write songs like that at a young age, you know, that, the sky's the limit. You know, so I was like, oh my god, you guys are amazing. You gotta, you should record that. You know, and it became their first single. And yeah. this, and we had a lot of fun with that first single because we we did this crazy thing that everyone thought was nuts, but it proved to really help help launch them and help get them their first fans around the country, which was that we made three videos for Mandy. And basically each video was a chapter in like a little teen soap opera. And each chapter ended in a cliffhanger. And each chapter had like opening credits and closing credits. And it was, we, we had like a lot of fun with it. We'd have like, you know, um, you know, previously on Mandy. By the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We'd have like highlights from the last video. And then we'd say, you know, here are some scenes from the next episode of Man <laughs> We just scenes from the next video, you know. That's and right. We had a lot of fun with it. But almost more interesting than than the the videos themselves was that we not more interesting, but more groundbreaking was that we distributed the videos through this little widget that people put on their MySpace pages. MySpace being an early social media network, a predecessor of Facebook. And it turned out that like Back then, the record companies weren't really dealing with the online uh, companies. They thought that putting your music online was a way to like lose money. 
your, record, your music was being stolen for free. But we basically gave away that video for free. We said, if you put this little widget on your page, every week we'll feed you a new chapter of Mandy. That's until, right. Until the three episodes have run their course. And if you remember, 60,000 kids put that widget on their page and remember, their pages were viewed by all their friends, like the same way that your Facebook pages do. So yep. those videos were viewed millions and millions of times off of that off of that widget on the Facebook page. In some ways, like we really pioneer sort of a very modern way of spreading music through the internet that no one had ever done before, and that was really exciting because we, we it, in fact. It was so groundbreaking that a lot of the people at the Sony Music Group, where the Jonas Brothers, where Columbia Records was and where the Jonas Brothers were signed, couldn't get their head around it. Like there were guys who were mad, like, you gave our music away for free on the internet? You know? That's right. And there were guys, and then, and then, and then off of the um, popularity from the internet, um, the, the song, the video, went to number one on this MTV countdown show called TRL that they used to have. Total Request Live, and it went to number one, at, you'll recall. On oh, I, I do, and it was so overwhelming, the response, and and there was nothing before it. Right. It was so overwhelming, MTV had to change their voting mechanism to push us further down because <laughs> the flood of calls and votes that came in, and it had everything to do with that song going what we call viral today on the internet. Yeah. It went viral and you were so uh, ahead of your time yet again. Well, 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 I was too ahead of my time because the people at Sony <laughs> didn't, didn't even believe, no, this is the best part. They didn't even believe that the song could go to number one on MTV based on popularity on the internet. They didn't get that. Nope. They didn't get that. They couldn't get their head around that because in their world, you became popular by being on the radio. And yeah. we weren't on the radio. So they were. They, there were people who really were actually skeptical. There were actually people who were like, you must have hired a company to like do all the voting and vote because there's no way you could be number one on TRL without being on the radio. And I said, no, it's this widget, you know. And by the <laughs> way, you remember the, the best, not the best thing, the, the most effective thing about the widget for TRL was that there was a button on the widget that said vote here for TRL. That's right. That's you right. Vote, you push that button, it took you to the side of TRL where you could vote for the record. So that's, you know, it, it was just, we were just basically coming up with new ways to market records. And it, it was so And exciting. if you remember uh, when they changed, because we came out of nowhere, right? The, the, it exploded because of that. And there was an immediate attachment to the guys. MTV changed the rules where you had to be on the radio and you had to chart. And they made it a combination for the first time rather than just voting so the fans that had already come through this widget, through MySpace, attacked MTV's servers and shut them down numerous times a day. <laughs> From all over the world, they would hit MTV at the exact same moment because one of the fathers of these young girls was a programmer and coder, and he was like, we're going to hit them from around the world at exactly this moment, and we kept shutting down the fans, true Jonas fans, kept shutting down, and MTV said, okay, Jonas fans, we've heard you, and they put us back on the chart. That's great. That's so good. <laughs> well, obviously, the Jonases have gone on to have an amazing, amazing career, and, and they look, and they, and they really did something that's so difficult to do, which is to have success as, 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 young, as young people, and then take some time off and come back and then actually reignite the career, maybe even bigger as full grown adults. That's very difficult to do. You know, I, I was, I'm a big, I'm, I'm a big junkie for old uh, countdown shows, music countdown shows. And there's yeah. this count, countdown, they, they play on, uh, on Sirius XM. They play um, the Casey Kasem countdowns from the 19th. I love those countdowns. And, and, and I heard this crazy thing on one of the Casey Kasem countdowns uh, in the last year or so where he was playing the, B the Bee Gees who had gone to number one with uh, How Could You Mend a Broken Heart? And he said, he said, you know, here's a record by the only set of siblings ever to have, then break up, then come back and go to number one. Mm. And it was the Bee Gees. And I thought, well, now there's two. <laughs> Now there's two, and happens to be three brothers. Exactly. Well, you know, there is a magic in three brothers, right? We Hanson is three there brothers, is. Is three brothers, the Jonas brothers are three brothers, and that leads me actually to another interesting story, which is that um, 
I got a phone call from uh, a manager, from Sia's manager, actually. Mm. He wanted me to, to meet a new group of three brothers. And um, they had come to his attention because there were these three guys who um, were students at Columbia University. And they would sit in the back of their class and like tweet out their music to music stars, trying to get the music stars to hear their song and retweet it like this crazy thing. And they would just do this like for, you know, every time in the back of class at Columbia and nobody ever answered. You know, they asked, they, they sent stuff to everybody and no one ever answered except eventually Sia answered them and said, oh, I love your song. It's great. Um, so I want to, and then she, she was even better than that. She said, I want to meet you guys. Wow. So these three guys show up and have brunch with Sia at a hotel downtown in New York. And she says, I really love you guys. I really want to help you guys. So she calls her manager, Jonathan Daniel, and says, um, I really want you to figure out a way to help these guys. Mm. And, and so Jonathan Daniel says, well, okay, three brothers. Hmm. Who do you call? I guess you call Steve Greenberg. If you have- <laughs> yeah. Lightning struck twice. Right. Three so- times is good. Right. So he calls me up because I, I have this thing. It might be in your wheelhouse, his three brothers. So I, I'll, I'll meet them. And the three guys were a group that is known as AJR. And they've had a series of platinum singles now and massive sold out shows. And they're a very popular group. And really, the reason I got introduced to AJR is because I'd already had success with groups consisting of three brothers. Hmm. So again, you see that like the more you do in life, you build a track record and you can, you can, um, you know, kind of use that track record to attract other people, essentially. Like, you know, the, the, the more you build, the more you have to, 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 to attract other people. You have, you have a lot of goodwill in the bank, essentially. And you can That's use right. that goodwill to, you know, to ultimately do more projects. So again, I, my message to everybody out there, if you wanted to have a career in this business, the key thing is do things, meet people, show up. Um, you know, you're not going to get anywhere just, you know, just sitting at home and, and dreaming about it. You've got to just do stuff. And even if you fail, if you fail, it'll help you. I, I remember when I was at Mercury, I signed a group, a very arty, weird group called Gorky's Zygotic Monkey. They were from Wales and they sang in Welsh. It was like alternative rock, but I love them, you know, and we sold nothing on Gorky's Zygotic Monkey. But as it happened, there was a journalist at the New York Times who really liked them. And so he wrote a really nice article about them. And I got to know him because he'd written this article about my band and he interviewed me and stuff. And um, because, because of that, when we first made the Hanson record, I was able to give him the Hanson record. And he was the first guy to hear the Hanson record. And he loved it. And he wrote this massive New York Times front page of the Arts and Leisure section article about Hanson. And that kind of became the template story about Hanson that everybody looked to and sort of borrowed from as that campaign unfolded. And he gave a tremendous amount of credibility to Hanson who might not have been accepted by rock critics because they were just kids. Right. But because Neil Strauss, who was the, the, the writer, he said, I love this, this is great. It gave everybody else permission to like it even though it was being sung by a 12 year old. And he really set the, the, the ball bouncing in the right and Danny Goldberg, who I work with at Mercury Records, um, who he was the president, um, when that big article came out um, about Hanson by Neil Strauss, Danny said to me, he goes, he goes, see, that's why it was worth signing Gorky's Zygotic Monkey. Yeah. Because you see, everything leads to something else. If you keep going and you're good at what you do, thing, every, everything should lead to more doors opening if you, if you do things right. That's so good. So good. Every relationship I have... Uh, you know, means something to me. Uh, but it's amazing. I don't have relationships for what they might bring, but they've all, I think I've been a blessing to them and they've been a blessing and an encouragement to me. Uh, but as I, you know, I'm a cancer survivor, as you know, coming back and tipping my toe in the water again, it's amazing. Uh, the folks like yourself that are there that are Hey, let's, let's figure something out. Let's do something. Uh, it is incredibly encouraging to do the right thing with people and then see it come back around. And, and by the way, it's, it's good to, to work with people who share your values. That's another mm-hmm. thing. Like, you know, life's too short to spend it with people who you just don't you know, see eye to eye with about just basic values in the world about, you know, yeah. what it means to 
be a good person in the world. You know, I work with an artist now who most people are familiar with named Andy Grammer. And he's one of the best guys in the world, you know, and, and he, he's worked really hard. You know, he was discovered busking on the street in Santa Monica by a guy who be- named Ben Singer, who became his manager. And uh, he actually wrote his first song, Keep Your Head Up, about being frustrated because he was singing out on the street all day and he didn't make, he didn't make one penny that day. And so he wrote this song to just kind of keep himself going called You Gotta Keep Your Head Up. And that launched his career. Um, but he's a great guy. And he's, and he's, again, he's just one of those people who has good, wants the world to be a better place. And it's been so exciting working with him over the years and helping him develop his career because he's brought a lot of good into the world, you know, through his yeah, music. No question. He seems like such a great guy. I've never met him. Uh, I think public opened for him a date or two, uh, my group public, but he, he is, he has had very positive impact. And of course, Again, you're right there in the middle figuring out which song it is that's going to just explode. Yeah. With him, by the way, we, we wanted to have some special sauce for him. So with him, we they did the first interactive video where literally you could, we found a company, an Israeli company actually, where they had this technology that they had invented where you could watch a video and then in real time make choices and just change the course of the video without, in a completely seamless fashion. And we said, oh, let's do that, you know, with Andy. And we did it with Keep Your Head Up. And, it, and because it was the first video ever to do that, it just gave him a little extra distinction. Like it, it allowed people to kind of like, you know, kind of put him ab- above all the other guys with a guitar who had a song that wanted to get on the radio and have a hit. He had this thing, this little special sauce, and it got a lot of press. He actually won an MTV award for most innovative video. So that was the little tiny thing that we did that just kind of helped propel that out of the pack and let it become something that, that would stand uh, head and shoulders above everything else. And it worked. Does it, does that video still exist out there? Uh, is it you know, still? The, it, the video exists, but the interactivity doesn't exist. So you can watch, keep your head up in normal form, but the interactivity, it required like this whole server on the part of the Israeli company and they kind of abandoned the, the server and moved on. The company actually has done very well over the years, but that early version of the technology, they don't support anymore. So you uh, I was looking for it to show, I was talking about you and those out of the box thinkers that really are using technology. And I was looking for the interactive version. Uh, for those of you that are listening, you could literally pick which floor you wanted to get off what you're in an elevator, which floor you would get off on, who you would join with. You had options. And at the end of the video, you're partying with all the people you chose on the roof. Incredible video. Yeah, it was, it was great. Um, it was great. I, I'm, I'm sad that you can't watch it anymore. Um, luckily, you can watch the Jonas Brothers Mandy videos. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, they're, they're back out there and are, are a testimony there. They, they testify to that whole season uh, very, very special. Well, Steve, you have another hit that's out there right now, yet again, uh, this time an app, not a technology necessarily, but you've got one of the top songs on the planet as we speak. Yeah, as it happens, um, we have the biggest TikTok song of the year so far, and I've never had a TikTok hit before, so I'm really excited. Like, you know, it's <laughs> always great to have a hit with the new thing that's happening, you know? So Absolutely. it's really been the, the, the year of TikTok, clearly, in the music business. And we had, made, we had signed this uh, artist named Conqueror last year who had a song called Banana that was uh, produced by and featuring Shaggy, who of course many people know. And um, we never could kind of figure out um, how to market it. Um, we wanted to take it to pop radio, but we felt we needed to develop some kind of story somewhere else before we would have the the ammunition to get it on the radio. And so we had always toyed with it, but never really got around to getting it, you know, getting it going. And then all of a sudden it just became this massive TikTok thing. And it's such an interesting lesson in how music spread so quickly today via TikTok, especially um, somebody in New Zealand loved the and did a remix of it and a friend of that person made up a dance to the remix and put the dance up on TikTok. within a couple of days the dance exploded on TikTok in mexico oh 
And from there, it just spread to the rest of the world. And right now it's, it's massive in China and India and of course the US and all over Europe. Um, we've had over 30 million TikTok videos made to that song now. Wow, that's and massive. It's very massive. And it, um, it also, people are curious, what's this song that the TikTok is to? So they're Shazamming it. So we've been in the top five in the world on the Shazam chart for almost a month now with this song. And we're also um, very, very high on the Spotify viral charts. And, um, and the Spotify streams are just going up every single day, every single day now. And, now. and of course, now we're starting to get on the radio as well. Oh, congratulations. So we have a bona fide TikTok sensation hit that we, um, I think, have managed to successfully uh, migrate just from TikTok to the rest of media, which is exciting. Because the thing about TikTok records is that not all of them are really records. You know, right because they're, sound, TikTok, they're almost sound bites they're they're right, right. cuz people are pulling sound bites from these records the record that contains the sound bite might be a great record or it might not be right mm -hmm. and so like when you when these tiktok things explode only some of them have the potential to actually be hits right cuz there's a real song there um like Roxanne by Ar by Arizona Zervis is a great example it's a real song that broke on tiktok or also Pow Fu is another yep. good one. Um, yeah, you know, and, and my my group, it was t totally unexpected for us with public. Yes. Make You Mine started the first month they came and they said, Kevin, and, and I started managing them six months before, they said, one of our old songs just doubled in streams. I said, well, pay attention. The next month they came back, they're like, our entire history just doubled. I said, okay, something's going on. Sure enough, it was TikTok. And they're collectively well over 300 million streams. Uh, it, it just. But it's a great song. That's why. It, but it's a great song. And it became kind of the love theme on TikTok. Right. Right. So that, so, so like, I think we were lucky. And I think, I think public and Conqueror have something in common, which is that in each case, these were like really good songs that people believed in as songs like mm -hmm. you Kevin really wanted to market public's song I really wanted to market Conqueror's song we couldn't exactly find the key of how to get in right, right to the culture with it uh, we were still toying with that right in, in each of our cases but um when the song exploded on TikTok there actually was a real song behind the soundbite that we could then bring to the rest of the world through Spotify through radio through all those other things amazing which is not the case with a lot of TikToks. No, no. And the ones that do, it's just changed everything. Uh, they race up the chart. Um, so it, it, it is amazing to watch. And, you know, what I said to public, I may not know TikTok, but what you want is someone who's been on this journey before and knows what a hit looks like. And I actually said in the middle of one of those calls where we were talking about all the to-dos, at the end of it, I said, this is all great, uh, but this thing over here is acting like a hit. I need to go see if there's something there. And that's something you've made an entire career of, Steve. Yeah, you have to, yeah, it, uh, being able to read a hit is a, is a real skill and being able to understand which uh, signals that you get are worth paying attention to and which are just noise, you know, and yeah, like anything, learning to read the record. It's like learning to read anything else in the world. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if you can do that, you can, you, can, you can have hits and you can continue to have hits. Because, you know, I think, I think in the business, we, look, we, we're in a great business. Anybody could have a hit. It's, it's possible for lightning to strike for anybody. But I think the trick is to have a hit and then another one and then another one and another one and keep doing it. And that just requires a real dedication and willingness and ability to learn the business and understand what makes a hit and look for those signs and help nurture those artists and their records and, and, get, and get that to place. If you can do that, you can have one after another after another after another. But by the way, the thrill of the music business is anybody can have one, which is great. Right. But a, but a career of them, especially given that you thought you would be on the academic side and it caught you and others, you know, the Clive Davises of this world who were on one pursuit and it, it captured them. Uh, you're one of those guys that it captured you and 
you you had an innate internal ability to find the nugget of gold uh and so i i'm I'm so blessed you gave selflessly to our family and sacrificed so much and the jonas brothers really would not exist without your involvement and can't thank you enough well, I, I, I so appreciate hearing that. It, it means the world to me. You guys not only are really talented people, but such good people that I can't imagine anybody more deserving of, of proactive attention. You know what I mean? At that point, <laughs> at that point in your lives, you, you are great people and also great talents and that's rare. And uh, if I could, if, if I've played some small role in the success of the band, I'm thrilled and, and honored. Absolutely. 100%. Now, so, so you know, can, can I can I can I plug my podcast? Is that okay? Oh, I was going to ask you. So, Steve, you're working on a new podcast yourself. Can you give us a little detail on that? Because I'm sure everybody that is interested in what I'm doing here with this podcast is going to be even more excited about what you have coming up. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what you have is pretty exciting, but uh, hopefully, mine's exciting too. I am launching a podcast. I'm called Speed of Sound, and the whole podcast series is about how pop music phenomena happen. Like, you, you know, something was really big. It might be a song. It might be a group. It might be a whole style of music. And you say, well, how did that happen? How'd that get so big? And if you like the kind of stories I just told uh, to Kevin, and uh, then you might just like my podcast. Um, and we're going to do everything. It, 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 there's so many different topics. We've recorded lots of, uh, lots of episodes already, ranging from how did the Beatles get so big so fast to, um, you know, how did rap suddenly emerge into the culture from being an underground thing to being such a massive thing to um, even, I even tell the story of who let the dogs out in quite a bit of depth um, about how did that go from not existing in the world to suddenly being this ubiquitous thing that, you know, sort of uh, captured the culture for a minute 20 years ago. In fact, funnily enough, the, the, the podcast is coming out on the 20th anniversary of the release of Who Let the Dogs Out. Oh, that's amazing. It's crazy. Um, but we, we, we even have a whole, we have um, of uh, the rise and fall of 70s disco. How oh, did, how did that's disco, my day. How did disco take over the culture so completely and how did it, um, self-destruct so rapidly. Amazing. So I think it could be a fun, fun podcast, lots of stories, lots of great guests, and hopefully people will listen. I will truly not miss a single episode. I cannot wait to hear it. And Steve, I appreciate you so much. I, I am a fan of you, my friend. Well, I'm a fan of you as well. So we have a mutual fan club for sure. <laughs> God bless. Steve, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.